Hey, good Tuesday morning, everybody. Welcome to the VolQuest podcast. I'm Eric Kane alongside Austin Price, Rob Lewis, and Brent Hubbs. As always, big thank you to our friends, Exterior Home Solutions, for being the presenting sponsor of the show. If you have a need, give them a call today. Roofing, siding, whatever the case may be, they've been local and trusted since 1999. That phone number is 865-524-5888 or visit them online at exteriorhomesolutions.com. We got a big show coming up today. Got a lot to talk about. A spring practice update as the Orange and White game is less than a week away. It's coming up this weekend. Big recruiting weekend. A lot of four star and a couple of five stars on campus. Uh, latest in the transfer portal for basketball. And Lady Vols have made a head coaching hire. But first, Brent Hubbs, two scrimmages are down. About three practices left. And then the Orange and White game. Spring practice is almost in the books for Tennessee. It is, it is almost in the books. And at some point, I want Rob's opinion on John Calipari heading to Arkansas. We'll, we'll dive into that one a little bit later in the podcast. But Sorry, yeah. I made this rundown at like, you know, 10 o'clock last night. Didn't know that there'd be big news in the SEC <laughs> yeah. afterwards. There is. We'll, we'll get we'll get to that when – and I'm sure Rob's got a thought or two. We'll get to that one when we get into the basketball transfer stuff and kind of roster management and, and this window for basketball out there. But as for Tennessee on the football front, you know, Austin, I think it's exactly what you thought with this team. I mean, the defensive line better be the story. If they're not the story of this spring, then 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 you've got some concerns, right? Uh, that They should be the story. They are the story. They've set the tone for the first two scrimmages. Those young offensive linemen are getting beaten, battered every day, which is not the worst thing in the world. Uh, but this is about where Tennessee's at in the defensive front right now, in my opinion. Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, obviously, I think there's been some good there from a standpoint of, like, besides the defensive line, you've, you've heard that the, the defensive backs have flashed, how much more athletic they are. You've heard that, you know, some of these younger wide receivers um, have flashed. Again, that unit more athletic. Um, you know, some positives, you know, with the Sean Bishop. You know, just based off the fact that, you know, you didn't have Peyton Lewis in spring and you lost Cam Self. So, um, and, and you just can't afford to throw Dylan Sampson out there and push him a ton of work, um, you know, because how important he is to the football team. So, I think I think it's a combination of everything, but you're right. It all starts with the D-line and Nico, but uh, the D-line specifically as a group. And uh, and I think that you're, it's good to hear that they those guys have taken what they did last year and they built upon it this offseason. Rob, it feels like Josh Heupel just really – he likes where this team is, knows that they have a long way to go, knows that you're never perfect, but in just kind of seeing what he has to work with right now compared to three years ago at this time, it, it's a mile of difference. Um, it feels like he likes this team, he likes the progress, and he knows that once you correct a few things, they can go off in the fall and win some games potentially. Yeah, I just think you know, through, through recruiting, through development, you know, through the portal, I, I just think they the, – most obvious difference is just roster, you know, development. And it's, you know, it's captain obvious, but it's also really true. You know, when, when you look at, you know, how they stack up against, you know, their peers in the sec compared to what you're talking about, Eric, three years ago, it's just, it's just night and day when, you know, when we're on the podcast and the issues that we're talking about are, you know, depth that, you know, let, you know, who's going to play left guard depth that, you know, what wide receivers sorting that out as opposed to, you know, do you have four linebackers or, you know, what, you know, do you have a, do you have a legit too deep in the secondary? I mean, you know, Tennessee has, has, um, you know, the problems they have now are the problems that, that, that teams are worried about making the playoffs have, not the teams that are worried about you know, having a winning record. Well, I mean, there, I mean, you think about it, when you look at this team from a year ago, who, who do you think they're going to miss really miss? Right. Okay. I mean, Tyler Barron was very productive, but I think everybody will tell you, that they can replace him, and you've heard the coaches talk about how much more they like their room and the chemistry there, and then Jalen Wright. Outside of that, who who on this roster do you look at and go, that was here a year ago that's no longer here, do you say, man, that is a major loss to overcome? Whereas the previous year, you're replacing Hendon Hooker, you're replacing Jalen Wright, Cedric Tillman, Byron Young. You just don't have that. That's why there's so much – enthusiasm and optimism because you know even through the portal stuff you didn't lose i mean tyler barron's the only real productive guy of note that that you lost i mean jayla mccullough's gone off this team but i mean i don't think anybody's going man there's a catastrophic loss for the secondary and i'm not trying to rip on Jalen mccullough but that just doesn't feel like that's the the vibe there so I, I think that's part of why this team is 
why the mojo of spring for this team is good because you're not sitting there going, oh, my gosh, we have to replace this amount of production. Can we do that from, from a year ago other well, than Jalen Wright? Well, I, and I think, you know, to your point, Hubs, is you didn't lose anybody of note except for Barron, and that's the deepest position you have on the football team. And you have a bunch of players that were freshmen a year ago that are going to be sophomores that are have a year – kind of to build up to this point that really should help this football team, right? I mean, there's guys in the back end that are sophomores. There's David Hobbs, Jeremiah T. Lander, Arian Carter, Ethan Davis, I mean, you, Cam Selden. You can keep going with players that were freshmen a year ago that are now sophomores that should really kind of fill in any kind of potential gaps there are and honestly make this team so much more deep um, you know, than it was a year ago. And AP, the most important one of those of all, you left off is Nico. I mean, you feel, yeah. you know, one of those freshmen that's a sophomore, it makes you, you know, ha- how much more excited are people about the most important position on the field now? Great spring? point. You look at the offensive line as we kind of shift gears here in a moment, but I, I want to look at you touched on the secondary. The offensive line, there's a lot of veterans that are banged up, dealing with some minor injuries right now. But I mean, Cooper Mays isn't going on awful lot. We know Javonta Sprague is not going. John Campbell's missed some time here lately. It's very much kind of who's healthy. You're out there with the ones on the offensive line right now, Brent. Kind of where would you say, evaluation wise, where have they grown on the offensive line this spring with Vice and Lane getting every opportunity in the world to snap the football, Sham at guard, and some other guys up there? Well, I mean, let me first say this. I mean, if you didn't, if you had not seen the production of the defensive line in a game last fall with all those guys coming back and you were hearing, about the defensive line dominating, you'd throw a big you throw a big wool on it, right? A big asterisk beside yeah. it because who are they going against? Now the what you're saying is, man, those young guys on the offensive line are getting baptism by fire against a really good defensive front, and and that's that's the that's the kind of shift, if you will, of where this thing is right now. Um, and, and listen, Vice and Lang's getting beat up, right? I mean, Max Anderson, Satterwhite, Vice and Lang, uh, as I just mentioned, Sham Umeroff. I mean. Those guys are taking their they're taking their beating. I mean, Glenn Ellerby said it best, um, and I had a story on this um, on Monday, but he he said it best. Like, you're going to be better for it on the other side, but there are going to be some dark days <laughs> and some rough times. And, and I think there has been for some of those young guys. Now, I think Lance Hurd's been really good. I think everybody feels really comfortable about where they are at left tackle. John Campbell's got to be out there. You kind of wonder, like, where's – we're, or let's get to fall. I think that's kind of where John Campbell is and kind of where everything is with, with John Campbell right now. It, it goes back to two things for me on the offensive line. Who's the backup center and who's going to be the left guard? Um, and, and you just got to figure that out. They, they have enough. I don't think they need to go portal shop in AP for a left guard. I think there, I think there's enough bodies in that room that you ought to be able to find a left guard who can be more than serviceable for you at that position and then you got to find a backup center and you got to hope that Cooper Mays stays healthy. But um, listen, I, I think that this spring is a blessing for the offensive line because it, it is about finding out who can go and all those young guys getting more reps than they could ever imagine is only going to benefit their development down the road in, in my mind. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, again, I, I think that, you know, you hit the nail on the head with every bit of that and, you know, you, I don't think you have to go to the portal for a left guard, um, and we'll see on running back. I'm not. I'm, I, if, I, if you had, if you said put money on it, you have to put some kind of money on it. I would tell you they're not going to go to the portal for a running back, um, as we said here on April 9th. So I mean, you know, time will tell, but it does not feel that way. It, at some point, they've got to you know let you know Lampley run with it. Andre Keurig, uh, Dane Davis, Sham Umarov. At some point, they've got. I mean, they've they've got players that either have played or have talent that they can put into that left guard spot. Which is why, I like, when you're under scholarship limitations as is, push some of those guys. And and I, you know, if if you give one or two more scholarships this year, and you feel like you're deep enough, I just the, the quicker you can get to that overall number, the better. Like this is a deep football team in a lot of ways in a lot of areas. There's no reason to take a body to take a body. So Tennessee fo- football spring practice, they will start. They will practice, I guess, uh, later this morning. Yeah. They'll practice on Thursday. They'll walk through on Friday. 
and then get set for the orange and white game coming up on Saturday. And then spring practice has come and gone. So just a couple more days left in that regard. AP big recruiting weekend, the last couple of days over on campus, a number of prospects were here and, and, you know, you and Matt had a chance to, to catch up with a lot of those guys. First, let's start with, um, a blue chipper five-star and David Sanders on the offensive line. Yeah. Um, you know, we're the only, the, the only outlet to get David Sanders, um, David, you know, really liked, you know, his visit to Tennessee. I told everybody in the war room on Friday morning, you know, big deal is, is he's not only coming this past weekend, he's coming back this weekend yeah. with George, you know, for the spring game. So that's back-to-back weekend. So, you know, everybody keeps asking the RPM. That, that's not right. But, I mean, Clemson, Clemson's Tennessee's biggest competition. Ohio State would also be in there. I, I think Georgia and Alabama and South Carolina are behind those schools. But I really think Tennessee's deep, deep, deep in this one. Um, I don't think you're making back-to-back trips to Knoxville if you're not heavily interested in Tennessee. For the, all that notion that you know he's privately committed to Clemson, we know Clemson's M.O. If a kid's privately committed, they're not letting him take all these trips over here that, uh, to potentially you know flip the momentum. Um, you know, his mom she runs the show, and uh, you know I don't think she would be wasting anybody's time having to spend a little bit of time around her. She's the sweetest lady, but she is very much you know like you know she just she wants to get in the recruitment, figure it out, and get out of the recruitment. She don't want to spend a whole lot of time doing this either. So um, you know I think that ultimately you know this is something where they're trying to figure out kind of where everything is. That's why they're trying to take as many visits as they can over the next few months, and then you know when we get to July start making our way towards a decision. Uh, Tennessee is deep in this one. A couple of other offensive line tackles and, and maybe an interior option that was here this weekend of names of note. One, Gaston, Josh Petty. How, how did those visits go? Yeah, well, Josh wasn't here. Okay. Um, but uh, Juan Gaston was. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, Tennessee, you know, is a school right there on the forefront with him, along with the home state Georgia Bulldogs. Brent, he is a big kid. He's a mountain um, like, you know, you look at him and David Sanders, if Tennessee were lucky enough to land those guys, land a Jalen Matthews, you talk about flipping the script at tackle in just a couple of years when you had Hurd out of the portal and then a couple of these players. And don't forget about Bennett Warren, who, again, has the length, has the measurables that you're looking for. Um, you know, Tennessee has really picked up their uh, tackle recruiting and has done a really nice job of it. They've got multiple options, and Gaston is a big boy. Yeah, they, I mean, they've expanded their board. They've done a good job. They, you know, they've this is not just, hey, we started this in January. They've been recruiting these guys for a couple of years and kind of build into this class with these tackles. Gaston's been on Tennessee's campus multiple times, which is a good thing. I, I may be wrong, Austin. I, you know, Florida State may be may end up being in there heavier than I think. To me, this feels like Georgia, Tennessee. I, I don't Agreed. see I, I don't see him going far away from home. I mean, Atlanta's three and a half hours. I think that's a pretty tight knit family, pretty close family. Um, I, I think I think the distance to Athens makes some sense there. I think that's who Tennessee's probably chasing. But but I, I don't see him going to Oregon, and I don't see him going a long ways away from home. I, I think he's going to stay pretty close to the area. I agree. Uh, you know, I, I love you know when he he. He hates doing interviews. He is not comfortable doing it, right? And Glenn Ellery's not that comfortable doing it um, as as a coach. But like one one cast, and he hates it. His mom's like, "You got to do it," you know. And 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 I I love that she took such great pleasure in watching him be uncomfortable. Like I mean, she was over there just 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 cutting up about it. I thought that was fantastic. And uh, but again, this is a kid that I think was more talkative, more engaged this weekend, and talking to some people than he's been in previous trips just because he's naturally a quiet, reserved, uh, you know, kid who, who doesn't do a whole lot of talking, but did more talking this weekend. A couple of wide receivers of note. Obviously, um, one of the highlights of us here on campus this weekend, top 50 wide receiver Travis Smith, but also in-state target, Tennessee Ole Miss, really just kind of getting out there and seeing stuff for the first time. That's Rodarius Jackson. He was at Ole Miss, and then he showed up on Tennessee's campus later in the weekend. How'd that go? Yeah, both visits, very, very, um, you know, good visits for both. Um, we'll start with Rodarius Jackson since he's popped up on the screen. Uh, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head, Eric, just kind of getting going in his recruitment. Um, you know, visited Ole Miss, visited Tennessee, um, you know, hasn't taken very many visits at all. He went down to Alabama. Um, you know, Missouri's heavily in play there. Um, you know, so is Auburn. 
you know, this is a kid who, again, is going to take his visits. He said to visit Tennessee um, in the middle of June officially and uh, will, will continues to rise up. You look at the rankings there. He's, you know, he's a four-star at ESPN, but he's a three-star by rivals in 24-7. I don't really think they've watched a whole lot of the tape most recently. Radarius is, is flying up the thing. Charles Power, the first to move him, he's inside the top 100 overall. Um, kid is a, a, a got phenomenal ball skills and uh, really, uh, you know, is I, I won't say a must get, but I mean, he's a big need for Tennessee just because he's in state, even though he's over on the west side of the state in Memphis. And then with Travis Smith, long, athletic, freaky, twitchy, and uh, you know, again, the more Tennessee can get a guy like Travis Smith to campus, the better. I know there was a lot more people on campus, but any other highlights, any other things of note that stood out? I know you guys already have a ton of uh, recruiting coverage over on the side, but anything else from this weekend? Well, I, I was really impressed with Jacoby Ward-Hubs. The kid's an interior offensive lineman, and he, he – I mean, if, if you sculpt one, that's what you want. I mean, like, he, he is 6'4", over 300, like, and is like, wide-shouldered, um, again, if you're if you're building one from scratch, you want them to look like Jacoby Ward. Yeah, my, I mean, my takeaway from the old just the whole weekend was just the the offensive line big bodies that they had. Yeah. Who, who who like you looked at them all and went, yeah, I'll take that one. Yeah, I'll take that one. I mean, even Sign me up. E- even the YouTube kid who is not going to be a tackle could could certainly play guard if you'd be willing to play guard. Just because I don't think he's got the length to play tackle, but. You just look at the number of bodies they have there. I mean, they're just um, just a bunch of really good looking kids who are who are in town for you know for the visit. Now the question is, can you get them back? How many times can you get them back? Um, can you get them back around George and some other players later on? I think most of these guys are going to come back for official visits in June. You mentioned David Sanders coming back th- this next weekend for the Orange and White game. That's the name of the game. Get them back as often as you can get them back. Tennessee's in a good spot with a bunch of offensive linemen. The question is, can they close, right? I mean, you start looking at it, you can count six or seven guys that they're deep in it. They're not going to take seven, but they're deep in it with a bunch of those guys. How many of them can they close is the question, I think, coming out of this April cycle as you get ready to go into the major cycle of June with official visits and decisions. Exactly. Outside of Sanders and George, who are a couple more that are going to be here this, this weekend? Well, you know, that be, you know of, I know it's early in the week. Yeah, I mean, it's early in the week. You know, Jalen Matthews is set to be back in town, offensive lineman from New Jersey. That's one I think Bears watching. You know, uh, I think Tennessee's done a really nice job there. Miami and Georgia, the other two teams, uh, heavily in the mix for Jalen Matthews. But uh, it, you know, it feels like that one. You know, it, it, Tennessee's got a lot of momentum and can only build upon it this coming weekend. Um, you know, really, really. Uh, you know, long tack, uh, offensive tackle, um, who, again, continues to uh, showcase extreme athleticism. And then, you know, Tennessee will have, uh, oh, geez, uh, the die kid from Indiana, um, you know, the, the, the you know defensive lineman. He's coming down here this weekend. That's a big visit. He's going to be here for, I think, three days, like Thursday, Friday, first part of Saturday. I don't think he'll actually be here for the game. Um, but, uh, again, I think that uh, – that's an opportunity, you know, to, to kind of impress a kid that, again, is coveted by so many um, across college football. And so, you know, Tennessee will end up with several in town, but the biggest is going to be David Sanders because you're getting him here back-to-back weeks. I mean, Hubs is right. The more you can get him here, the better. The fact you're coming here back-to-back weeks, um, it, it, to me, is a big, big deal. And so, you know, like it's kind of like, you know, Jamie French isn't coming back in town this weekend, but you know, can Tennessee get him back in maybe for the Memorial Day event before he comes back for his official visit in June? Like the little things like that, I think will uh, start kind of telling you kind of where some of this stuff is. AP, what have you named that event for this year? I haven't. It's just A65 Live. Which no, is so, so it's a so Rocky Top of Palooza is officially in the ground. Yes, very. Okay. So, so is Orange Carpet Day? It's gone. You know, I always liked Orange Carpet Day. <laughs> I, 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 I I like the branding. Um, I, I like I, Notre Dame's Notre Dame's pot of gold weekend. I thought, you know, again, nice. Yeah, that, I mean, it works, it works for them. You've got to come up with something that ties it into to, to the balloon arches that that line the, the Anderson Training Center for um, for recruiting weekends. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> big, props, big props to Trey Johnson. He has uh, been really efficient. 
the last uh, couple of uh, you know visit weekends. I tell you what, they've had some. They've had, I mean, and props to the coaching staff. They've had, they've had the types of players in town this month that you want to have in town. Yes, I mean, they, they, they've had some. Whether it's been for a Saturday event or during the week, that they've had some quality prospects in town th- this month, which is what you have to do in spring practice. That that's the name of the game now. No offense to what you're getting done on the field. It's about what you're getting done in terms of unofficial visits that month. And, and I think Tennessee's done a solid job there this month. Absolutely. Best recruiting coverage in the market. That's at VolQuest.com, plus tons of other stuff. We're going to talk hoops when we return here on the VolQuest podcast. Really do want to give a quick shout out uh, to our friends over at Prime Video. Sure, the Final Fours this weekend, championship game was last night, but throughout the month of March, man, Prime Video had you covered. You were watching games live on your phone, on your laptop, you were relaxing at home and watching on Prime Video with that subscription. Prime Video also gives you choices to add on channels like Paramount Plus and Max, both featuring in some tournament games throughout the month of March, all in one place. It was March, it was madness, and you saw it all on Prime Video. So shout out Prime Video, and as always, big shout out to our friends over at Exterior Home Solutions. Severe weather can strike at any time in East Tennessee, and Mother Nature can do severe damage to the first and most important line of defense that you and your family have against Mother Nature, and that is your roof. Whenever she strikes, make sure that you call the people that I call. Make sure you trust the people that I trust, and that's my friends at Exterior Home Solutions, because they're more than friends, they're truly family. A65-524-5888 or online at our friends, exteriorhomesolutions.com, the presenting sponsors of the VolQuest podcast. Rob Lewis, so far, one player has left Tennessee's roster and went into the transfer portal. What in a shock. Freddie DeLeon, could there be more as the days kind of trickle on this week? Sure there could. I mean, you kind of have your head, head in your sand if you, know, you don't think that's a possibility in, in this current climate. But, you know, I don't know of anybody, you know, specifically that, you know, has one foot out the door or anything like that. I do think Tennessee has guys on the roster that are, you know, through third parties or, or however you want to say it are, are probably hearing from from other programs and, and, you know, this is, you, you certainly got to babysit. I mean, does Tennessee have any staff movement, um, you know, and how would, how would that affect maybe individuals if they were you know, close to a certain coach or, or whatnot? So I would say it's fluid. I would say, you know, as you said, Eric, Freddie, not a real surprise. Um, you know, it might be a little surprising if somebody else left, but not, not, not really, not, not in this day and age, but I, I think Tennessee's in a better spot than most. I mean, you made it through the, the, the first whole full week and, and a weekend of the off season and, and you don't have guys scrambling to, to, to jump ship and, you know, to, and this comes after the staff had, had lengthy detailed, you know, very transparent meetings with, with the individual players, kind of exit interviews on the season, you know, where you're at, you know, where, where you think you are in the program, where you want, where you want to be in the program and, you know, what do you have to do to, to, to get there um, individually you know, as far as work and, and, to not have, and, and that's generally, trust me, in, in experience when a, after that week or after specific days that in, in the past, that's when we've seen multiple guys heading to the portal from from Tennessee is is after that 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 first full week when when they they do really sit down and and um, you know break down the whole season and, and, and what lies ahead. So yeah, there there could be Eric. Long answer, yes, there could be you know another departure right now. I. There, I don't know of anybody that it, that is really leading towards doing that, but it's you know certainly still a possibility. Rob, after we saw Julian Phillips, now he played more than Dillion did, but you know didn't play a, a ton, ton, and then moved on. Freddie didn't play hardly at all, moved on. These are two high-profile guys. Do we think this is this will be the kind? Those will be the last kind of two guys that we see heavy recruits. Yeah, and Nick Spray, as long as he's going to be here, he's going to solely focus on the portal. I, you know, I wouldn't say solely on the portal, but, but man, I, I think I'm not saying just, they won't recruit players from high school. I'm saying like the higher end guys. I mean, you know, I mean, AP, I could never say never, but man, I mean, this the evidence would say that that's certainly what, what you need to do. I mean, you've gone all in, like like you just said, on Julian, on Freddie, and you know, those were. Those were recruitments where NIL was a factor, and uh, you know what kind of what kind of return did you get? Did you get on that? So uh, to me, AP, I, I, I'm with you. I, I would 
really lean heavily more towards the portal. Um, you know, whether that's, you know, a, a grad transfer guy or, you know, does somebody leave it with eligibility, which I think is I mean, in, in both sports. Don't you guys think more so that the grad transfer, it's the, it's the kid, it's the Lance Hurd or somebody, you know, leaving from a power five that has multiple years of eligibility left. Oh, and yeah. It's really kind of the biggest prize out, out there in the transfer world. So, you know, I think Tennessee will be heavily involved. I mean, I think we're going to hear literally dozens of names this week that Tennessee's, you know, involved with or allegedly involved with in the transfer portal on the basketball side of things. But I think not just Tennessee AP, I think a lot of people are, are going to start, you know, looking at, you know, who the better teams are, who, you know, who's put the best product on the floor and conclude that it's, you know, if you're really talking about investing in IL, you're much better off, you know, using that in the portal. Well, here's the thing for me, Rob, that, that, that you got to look at. I mean, one, the, the investment out of the high school ranks in the NIL for an elite player is obviously high. You're also spending three or four years recruiting that kid, okay? So your time and investment in recruiting him is higher. And then when you get to tournament action, how much did we hear this year? Have we heard about older teams? Older teams are, 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 are built more for tournament runs than, than one-and-done younger teams, right? I mean, that was the knock on Kentucky, leaving the tournament early. I mean, you look at – I mean, Connecticut's an older team. Purdue's an older team. Those are the two teams in the finals. I mean, there, there's a lot of people – if you're building towards the end of the season, is it easier to build with transfers who have age on them versus, hey, I'm going to try to break in some young thoroughbreds from November and have them ready for March to go against some 22- and 23-year-olds? I mean, I I think it's really going to be interesting to see how it impacts recruiting because, I mean, you just mentioned it. I mean, who, I mean, who's the best, most impactful freshman in this tournament? I mean, I, I can't the really. From, the kid from UConn, maybe. Yeah, I I, but he's got guys yeah. around him, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not. There's not a Zion Williamson you right. know, in this tournament or Anthony Davis in the in this in this tournament, and I. I'm, I'm going to be very interested to see how it impacts recruiting. Like when we coach it, I mean, there's getting to be a, to, we're to the point now where there's a pretty big body of evidence about who's, who's having a bigger impact, you know, the most talented freshman in the world or, you know, a bunch of transfers who like Dalton connect. You didn't you know, even know who he was last year. My point being, how, how, how much longer are these coaches going to be willing to jump through these hoops, you know, and spend their entire summer, you know, in some backwater, you know, gym watching for three or know, four years, team. by the way. Yeah. <laughs> not I mean, for it, one it, summer, for three or four years. I mean, it, like, you look at Don Connect, Mark Spears, DJ Burns, even. I mean, like all these guys have, you know, been in, you know, college for a handful of years and have been in the weight rooms and, you know. Yeah. I mean, so why, if I'm a college, if I'm a college coach, why do I want to spend, you know, the 10 days in, in Augusta, Georgia in, in July? You know, when, <laughs> you know, or, you know, why do I want to, you know, fly, you know, practice my own team on, on Tuesday night, November, and then, you know, hop on a private jet really quick and fly two hours to go watch a high school game for an hour and, and then, you know, get home at 1 a.m. And, you know, for, for a kid that, to, to, to watch a junior in high school who I might not even get an official visit from, you know, I just, I, 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 I really wonder how it's going to impact how coaches in, impact, in, invest. <laughs> their time in recruiting going forward. I know yeah, how talking about the, nine. <laughs> you're talking about the lack of freshmen that have, you know, been the story in this tournament. And of course, you know, Kentucky was one and done in the NCAA tournament and uh, the king of one and dones, John Calipari, Rob Lewis, he, he's on the move and cer certain reports that I've read on a, on a Monday morning is he's going to be changing his approach, getting more away from the one and dones more towards the transfer portal, kind of going on with what you were just talking about that. I know you're talking about that from a Tennessee perspective, but Maybe John Cobb is going to change his stripes as well as he moves on to Fayetteville. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I just don't see how anybody can look at you know at the landscape out there and not not come to that conclusion about where your, you know, not just your time but your, your nil resources and, and all that is it. You're not getting a much higher return on investment from the old, you know, the older crowd, which is you know not surprising. And man, that what a seismic shift for for Cal to to pull the pull the plug pull the plug. And, and leave Kentucky. I mean, I, I honestly think it's it's good for both parties. Personally, I mean, from the outside looking in, 
you know, it was kind of fun to gawk at the train wreck, you know, after a big loss or, you know, after another early exit from, uh, from the NCAA tournament. But I, I think it, it, it looks to me like a, a, you know, a good move for, for both parties. And it has a little bit, you know, I know the circumstances aren't exactly similar to how it happened, but has a little bit of Rick Barnes to Tennessee energy, I, I think. You know, I think it's crazy in basketball when you think about it. I mean, USC's coach goes to SMU. Arkansas's coach goes to USC, and Kentucky's coach goes to Arkansas. Like, that feels like the total reverse order of how it's yeah. supposed to go, you know, in, in the packing of things. That just – kind of tells you where college basketball is and, and, and how it goes. I'm more fascinated by what Kentucky does next, Rob, and, and kind of what direction they go. Where I mean, there's all these rumors that have been out there about, you know, Mitch Barnhart had no say in Calipari and in and, and the hire and then obviously didn't really deal with him while he was there. Is, is Where's Mitch's say in this next hire? What direction does does Kentucky go with, with the next one, I, I think is – is really fascinating because I think I think John Calipari can win wherever he goes and, and has proven that and will win at Arkansas. I think it's more fascinating to see what Kentucky does moving forward next and what kind of philosophy they want um, in recruiting and NIL and transfer portal and all the things that we've just been talking about. I think it's pretty interesting to watch. It's going to be crazy to watch and just you know, I mean these these jobs don't come up. up open very often, whether we're talking, you know, football, you know, college football, college basketball, whatever. I mean, this is, I mean, this is one of the premier jobs in, in, in college basketball. I mean, there's drama with Cal's exit and, you know, there was drama with him, with him, with him staying. So yeah, I mean, this is going to be a, a, a I'm, I'm just glad that we're, you know, have our popcorn and are, you know, <laughs> and, and are watching it from, from our recliner and not, you know, Hubbard, Hubbard's not out on Alcoa highway with a pair of binoculars for, for this one. I've but, uh, a couple times. Uh, I mean, you hear day notes, but y'all, I mean, eighteen I, millions. The yeah, I, just, I just can't. I just can't see that. Can you? I mean, when when you're, I mean, I know you dodged a bullet. You didn't have to pay Cal the the thirty plus, you know, to to 34. make that to to make that departure happen. But and eighteen million just seems like a, a lot of money. I know, you know, anonymous message board people are like, oh, Kentucky, you know, that's nothing to Kentucky. Kentucky's got it. Uh, They'll write that check. I don't. I don't know that they were going to write that check. I mean, if does Scott Drew listen? I mean, what? Why would you leave? I mean, here's what people I, I think, and and you guys all know this. What, whatever the sport, I think people, you know, the general fans really underestimate that more and more coaches. I think are realizing the grass is not always greener. I mean, if they're in a good situation, making really good money, and very importantly, with a good administrative you know, team behind them that they trust and, and, you know, are on the same page with. And I think it's tough to, to pull people away from situations like that where they're winning. Well, it makes you wonder where Bruce Pearl's at, you know, mm-hmm. what, what seven, we, seven million I hear, which I think is a lot more manageable than 18. Right. You know, where, where are they at there? And, and then again, you're right. I mean, in this, in this day and age, I mean, look, look at who's winning. It's not the blue bloods that are winning the NCAA tournament every year. I mean, you can win it in a, from a million different places. And so if you're comfortable where you're at, do you feel like that's the, you know, it's a not necessarily a safer job, but you've got the backing of everybody you need to have the backing of. And um, everybody's paying real money, right? I mean, it used to be that, I mean, the, the disparity in salary between Kentucky and Auburn in basketball was just monumental. It's just not where we're at in basketball these days. I mean, making five, $6 million is not, you know, is is more the norm than it is anything else. It feels like, you know, for a lot of places in college basketball. So I don't know. I, I think it's going to be there's going to be a ton of rumors. It's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, I mean, Danny Hurley. I mean, Danny Hurley allegedly. You know, we're recording this on Monday, but allegedly has has put it out there that he's not interested. But you know, that guy. That's the last thing he wants to be dealing with today. You know, before his team plays for a national title. I mean, I. I don't see any way he leaves. I mean, people say, oh, Kentucky's a bigger job. It's true, but he also just, you know, was playing for his second na- national championship in a row. I mean, what, what can he, you know, obviously he doesn't need to leave UConn to do it at the highest level. I, U- UConn's a better job. I, man, I I, I kind of think BP makes a lot of sense, personally. Yeah, right? I, mean, I mean, Hurley's got no pressure at UConn, right? I mean, you're rolling to the Big East. Let's get to the tournament, build your team for that moment now. Do you get bored in the regular season? I mean, maybe, but I mean, 
you, you come into a league like this where they're going to beat the, the brakes off of you all the time. Now, do you feel like the, the changing landscape in football is going to carry over into basketball with super conferences? Yeah. That becomes something you're thinking about long term? M- maybe that brings a school like a UConn or Big East school or, or something like that into effect, but I, I don't I don't know. I would let that play out, see how it happens, because I think he can get a job. Oh, he can get a job anywhere else. else. UConn, yeah. since 1999, has won – if they win, if they if they won last night, again, we're taping this on Monday, they would have won six national titles since 1999 with three different head coaches. That that right there is a – to me, that's a, a, a heck of a stat when you think about just kind of in the last 25 years. And I don't, I don't know this. him. I'm going to say, I, I don't know Hurley, obviously, but I mean, just people, I know people, you know, national guys and some people in the Northeast who do not believe he and his wife would be great fits for, for Lexington in, in the fishbowl. Last thing on this, Rob, uh, it, it's a little bit of TBD right now, depending on what direction Kentucky does go and kind of who they lure over there. But if you're a Tennessee fan, are you excited that John Calipari is leaving Kentucky or? based on the success you've had against Kentucky with Rick Barnes, are you kind of upset that, that John Kyle Parry is leaving Kentucky? How are you viewing this if you're a Tennessee fan outside of just laughing at the situation? I think upset is a strong word, but I think yeah. if you're a Tennessee fan, you're pretty comfortable with, with, with where, you, where you are with Kentucky's program over the last, you know, five, six, seven, eight years. I mean, I, I think it's been pretty clear. I mean, Rick, Rick Barnes' record against Cal is pretty clear. I mean, Tennessee – has had the upper hand in that rivalry for a while. So if I'm if I'm Tennessee fans, I was pretty comfortable with Cal there. I mean, I, I mean, you can't really say that you know, you're going to wake the giant because it's not like Kentucky basketball has hasn't been any good. But I, I think they have probably certainly underachieved and definitely by their standards for the past you know five you know six year, years when you're talking about NCAA tournament success. So I mean, I not just Tennessee. I mean, I think the rest of the SEC. I mean, I if you don't. If Kentucky makes the right hire on this one, then you know you're, you're dealing with the end for for the next decade. Plus. Yeah, I, I think Kentucky's going to get tougher. I, I think that's going to be one of their 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 deals when they look through this coach. I, I don't I don't think they want to play as much finesse as I think they want to play a more physical brand of basketball. And I think that it's hard to play physical when you're dealing with all the one and dones that they're dealing with. But you know, it was about offense, offense, offense. I, I think they're not going to go defensive minded and score fifty points a game. But I think they are going to be a more physical, play a more physical brand of basketball than we've seen them play the last couple of years with that roster. Last subject here on today's uh, podcast, I want to touch on the Lady Balls hiring of Kim Caldwell. A um, lot of smoke. A lot of times, there's usually fire there most of the times, but sometimes there's a screen there. This wasn't a screen. Danny White hires Kim Caldwell. One year at Marshall, Brent Hubbs. Very successful year. But one year Division One coaching after a really successful stint, including a national championship at the D two level, feels like she wins when given the opportunity. But this one's going to be an opportunity like like nothing else. She coaches a exciting brand of basketball, a lot of three pointers, a lot of offense. What do you like and, and what do you dislike about the Kim Caldwell hire for the Lady Ball basketball program? Well, they're aggressive defensively too. I think they average forcing twenty four turnovers a game. I mean, she the thing that she has is she has a brand and a style that they're going to play. They're going to play with an identity. Um, and, and I think for for Danny White, that's a big deal, right? We remember the Josh Heifel press conference, and he talked about exciting, you know, fun to watch, entertaining style of play. Um, I, I think that's something that, that you know, he was looking at. He, he, but here's the thing. I mean, you know, everybody's hoping she's Bruce Pearl, right, that, that she's a Bruce Pearl type deal coming from sort of out of nowhere, making a quick splash like he did at Milwaukee after – uh, Southern Indiana and the run he had there in D2 uh, and then jumps right into the SEC and 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 hits the ground running. Now, I think he inher- inherited a pretty good basketball team when he got to Tennessee that, that he let those guys, he freed them up and let them go play. I don't know that this roster for the Lady Vols is, is nearly to that level of competitiveness, you know, in the SEC. I think the one question with her is going to be real simple. How long's the learning curve to recruiting, to roster management, to the transfer portal, to NIL, things she did not deal with in a one-year stint at Marshall. Now, she did fine in, in the transfer portal. I think she got five players. She brought one with her from, from Glenville. Um, but but this is a different animal there. So what's the learning curve in recruiting in the transfer portal at, at this level? Um, 
but she has an identity and a brand that she's going to play with. And I think that was somewhat of appealing um, to Danny White. Uh, who else did they talk to? I don't know that we'll ever know. I mean, this will be presented as this was the top priority in the first place that they went. There were other candidates. There were other more experienced candidates that Tennessee gauged interest in. How much interest did they get in return? Much to what Rob is saying about the Kentucky deal. You know, did, did people do a deep dive as to why there was a coaching change or did people look at it and go, you know what? I got a good administration. I don't have a ton of pressure. I'm making good money here. I don't want to uproot my family. And they just removed an alum who went to the Sweet 16 twice the last three years. I'm not sure that's a place where I want to really go and, and, and settle in on. Um, but th this fits a lot of what Danny White's looking for. Somebody, I think first and foremost, we, we mentioned it in the war room, Austin, somebody with an edge. What does edge mean? I think edge is style and identity. And she has a brand of basketball that she plays. And it's pretty clear what it is. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I think her success will be predicated on, you know, what they're able to do from an NIL perspective. You know, um, you know, I think you can, you can flip a roster, you can get players. You don't have to be a strong recruiter. Um, you know, if you have decent NIL funds. And I just mean, like, I don't I don't feel like Tennessee had great NIL funds with the Lady Vols the last, you know, couple of years. Um, I think a little bit here and there, but not like what I think it could be. And, you know, if, if, if they're able to get to that point, um, then I think that, you know, her brand of basketball with elite players out of the portal could mean a return trip to the Final Four for the first time since 2008. And, you know, Again, I think it, it, it's a, as Hub said, it's kind of a combination of everything. It's how does she adjust to it all? Um, but I think it, it, it definitely has, involves, you know, the buy-in from the NIL perspective. Yeah, they got to get organized on that side. It's not just about having, you know, necessarily just raising more money, but you got to have a, you got to have an organization and a plan. And, and right. I think I, I don't think that they had that previously as they tried to adjust to what NIL was and 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 all those types of things. And so. We'll see what that looks like moving forward, um, you know, with Coach Caldwell and, and what kind of, you know, what that plan looks like, how organized it is, what does their staff look like, um, you know, what kind of ties do they have to the Power Five level, all of those things. But, I mean, listen, Rob, you don't, you don't win as many games as she's won without being able to coach the game of basketball. I think it's about the other things that she has to – flatten the learning curve as fast as she can for them, for those things in order to go be successful. Oh, got me. Got me. Twice. So I, I'll be the first to tell you, I, I don't know, you know, the nuts and bolts of that program, but, you know, from the outside looking in, I mean, that's, it's a little bit like, you know, football or, or, or baseball in this sport or in this conference, you talked about learning curve and there's, you know, it's, it's pretty steep. You know, when, when you're talking about LSU, South Carolina, I mean, if you're going to just compete in this conference, you're going to be one of the best programs in, in the country. And that's, you know, it can be a meat grinder, but I don't, you know, obviously you know, trying to continue Pat's legacy from, from when that's when inside the family ha has not worked out. Um, or really, you know, got even close. So, I mean, I, I, I applaud Danny for, you know, kind of being, making it his own hire in this one. And I, and I think he probably was in an easier position than previous people where, you know, enough time has passed. There's enough, you know, there's enough evidence out there that, hey, you know, we tried to, you know, to, to keep it, you know, keep, you know, Pat's coaching tree, what what sustained it that didn't work out you know i think danny was in a spot where it wasn't that controversial to go outside at this point oh, yeah kind of on that the, note as we bring this conversation to a I'll close say, one second i will say the next 30 days i think is very important for her because that roster as brent pointed out is not super strong and tennessee needs to be able to add some key pieces that next 30 days i think is pivotal for her first year to kind of set the foundation because, again, Tennessee, remember, is the only program that's made the NCAA tournament every season of its existence. And so I think the next 30 days will be huge. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I, I like that Danny White went outside the, the quote-unquote family for this. Um, you know, just, just I mean, if the, if the best candidate came from within the family, hire that person, male, female, whatever. But he felt the best candidate did not come from the quote-unquote family. So I like that he ventured out. First time in Lady Ball program history that the hires ever come from, you know, not a – Tennessee person. And then secondly, uh, Brent, you know, we'll see if it, you know, has the same results, 
you know, we thought he might go in a direction of an established Power 5 coach, whatever the case is. This is very much a Danny White hire. The resume, some of those names that he's hired at previous stops, the Nate Oates, um, the Lance Leopold, some of the others, very much kind of, uh, and each individual is different, but kind of the under-the-radar niche, um, and, and you see where there are now, and we'll see what Kim Caldwell does at Tennessee and it's, see if she has that success. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think it's a lot easier to go hire a Nate Oates to Buffalo or a Leopold to Buffalo because it's Buffalo. That's right. This is this is at one point yeah. perceived the Alabama football of women's basketball. Now it, it's shifted, right? But but I mean, this is it, it's very much you know. You look at the tradition in the history. You can call it the, you know, you can call it uh, one of those types of programs. And that's so so it's it's a little bit more of a gamble to to do it this way. Agreed. But, but then you have you know you got evidence. I mean, nobody knew who Tony Vitello was. I mean, the story of Tony Vitello's opening press conference in that 180 degree day was, man, that's a good looking dude, right? Like nobody knew anything about his baseball background. I mean, they didn't know anything about the guy. I mean, seriously. And, and he stepped Very in. Right. Look, look what he's done at Tennessee. You're hoping that you've hit something like that. Um, but only time's going to tell. And I, I agree with Austin that the next month is pivotal for what that roster looks like next year so that this thing's not a three or four year type deal, but you can flip it and and get going pretty quickly here and let her style of play help resonate you in the recruiting front and the transfer portal moving forward. We discussed a lot here today on the VolQuest podcast, uh, Tennessee transfer portal, departures, potentially some names out there for Tennessee to go after. Of course, uh, the latest in the Lady Vols coaching search that ends with Kim Caldwell, Tennessee football spring practice, recruiting, didn't even touch on Tennessee baseball, series win, the third straight in league play on the fourth rubber match of SEC play. Got a lot over there on the 3-2-1. Got to do something uh, on Friday nights, Eric Kane. You got to figure out that they play baseball for nine innings on Friday night. Yep, got to figure that out. They figure that out, man. <laughs> Pretty good baseball team. <laughs> Might not ever lose a game, yeah. But uh, nonetheless, got tons of baseball coverage over on the side as well with the weekly 3-2-1. We've got pretty much anything you possibly want over at VolQuest.com. Brent, it's uh, a great time to sign up. And if you're watching on YouTube right now, there is a there is a promo code in the description where you can get a um, a discount for two months on the site. And there's so much at the site right now from recruiting to basketball to football, that and more. No better time to join us at VolQuest.com than right now as we kind of continue on with crossover season. Yeah, no doubt. And, and again, we appreciate everybody who watches on YouTube and listens in on whatever podcast format you're listening to. Um, we, we certainly appreciate that. But, but there's a lot more to the site than just this podcast. So uh, if you're seeing this on YouTube, you see the promo code, take it full advantage of that. Get two months at a special rate and check us out because it's not slowing down. We've got portal season wide open. Um, football portal season's getting ready to start back up for the second run. Yeah. And then we just talked about all the recruiting that's going to take place over the next couple of months. So it is a great time to check us out and you're going to blink and it's going to be fall camp before we know what happens. He's Brent Hubbs, awesome price. Rob Lewis, I'm Eric Kane. As always, thank you so much to our friends, Exterior Home Solutions. Local and trusted since 1999, 865-524-5888 and online at exteriorhomesolutions.com. Thank you guys, as always, for tuning in and joining us here on the VolQuest Podcast.